and Warren Gatlin was giving out to Trevor Leota saying, oh, you know, that's lazy Trev, you know, get up fast. And, and everyone was just like sliding down their chair going like this because Gats has given out to Trev and we've got contact sessions straight after the video session. <laughs> no way. So like we went out to the contact session and Trev was just absolutely ending people. And then that's after that session, one lad nearly got decapitated, Johnny Hilton, a fullback. And after that game, that's when Trev was banned from tackling and training. Joe presents House of Rugby, United Rugby Championship, together with Bank of Ireland, proud supporter of the four Irish provinces. Welcome to House of Rugby, and this week, unfortunately, we're missing one person, Jason Hennessy. Just myself and Megan will be leading you through the show because Jason decided to go watch some football. Yeah, football. This is House of Rugby, <laughs> and he had a great time, lost his passport. I'm sure it was all worth it. We're going to miss him, but we have a great replacement. We have a former Connacht, Leinster, and Irish rugby player and legend, Mike McCarthy. Great to have you here, sir. Guys, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, it's an honour to be I'm very, very excited. Thank you. I actually believe you were on the flight that Jason was supposed to get over from Newcastle. Yeah, I was on the flight. There was some dusty old heads. So, uh, <laughs> Jason's yeah, well, I, I didn't realise he hadn't made it. So, uh, look, I'm glad to be here. Thanks very much for having me. Hey, we're going to ask you 10 questions straight right. up. We're going to keep that energy, all right? OK, OK. And I'll Megan, try. I think you have the first question yeah, for Mike. Yeah, we have some really good questions yeah, coming right. in from social media. I know you might be a little bit worried, but uh, the first one is... Actually, I would like to know, is it true that you used to kiss the opposition at the bottom of the rough? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. Well, occasionally, yeah. I used to do some pretty weird stuff when I played. So, look, I wasn't very good at much, but I think I, I was an all right tackler mm -hmm. and weird chat on the pitch was kind of one of my strengths as well. So, actually, Bernard Jackman, I saw him at the game today, he reminded me of something. I was at the bottom of, of a ruck and I was... Oh, asking someone for some Szechuan tricking. So it's, <laughs> yeah. very, it's very random. And the mouse trap used to be my favourite, the mouse trap. So do you remember the choke tackle where you used to be able to hold people up? It's kind of a, I think it's a bit of a dying art now. Yeah. yeah. So I used to have, like, I'd have someone held up and I'd be saying, oh, put the cheese in the mouse trap. We've got the cheese in the mouse trap. And like, yeah, just people would be looking at me pretty strange thinking what's going on. But oh I used to God. entertain myself. I'd, I'd say your own players even thought it was a bit strange, did they? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, like, yeah. I th that's one thing though, I look back now and I think, I wish I was more myself when I was a player because mm -hmm. you see the like, kind of like guys or g girls getting their personalities across now. Mm -hmm. And I think when I was playing, I was a bit scared of, you know, I was putting on this front in front of the coaches where all the lads that know me in the change room know I'm, I love a bit of crack and uh, I've got a bit of a strange sense of humour. Mm -hmm. But probably didn't see that. Sorry, it's a quick fire questions. I'm going on a bit here, aren't no, I? No, I love it. Yeah. But did you feel like Mike that your personality might have held you back from many selections at all? Well, I think so. Yeah, I think that's why. So mm. you know, say for example, if I'm in Irish camp and going around the hotel, like I'd be having the crack with the lads yeah. in the room and the the, the team room, etc. But then when I was around the coaches, I was like, real pretending, stiff, real stiff and awkward, yeah. and just wasn't myself. And uh, yeah, because I always thought it would affect selection, which, you know, every coach is different and perhaps with some coaches it would affect it, but, you know. There was a lot of stuff that you did behind closed doors that not many people would <coughs> see. You know, you're staying up late at night. You, yeah. you always said that you, you're not a great sleeper. And yeah. you do a lot of homework behind closed doors so people that, that wouldn't see it. Oh, yeah. No, no, I worked hard. You know, yeah, I worked hard. But, um, yeah, just uh, sometimes you're, I was always overthinking things that, mm. you know, my... You know, I like having a bit of fun, I like having a bit of crack, and I always thought, did that reflect in selection maybe? So I always tried to pull it back a bit, but looking back now, I wish I was just myself. Yeah. yeah. And you got your start late with the Irish team. It was 29, <clears throat> you got your first cap, is it? Yeah, 29. I was at Connacht, and uh, I thought the ship had sailed, to be honest, because, uh, you know, I always had aspirations to play. Well, everyone has aspirations to play test match rugby, but, uh, yeah, I was obviously getting on a bit and uh, just kept, I suppose, knocking at the door, persevering, and managed to yeah yeah get there and get a few caps so that was nice. I wish I had more. Mike, another question that came in from Jason Hegarty and um, he was asking um, do you feel a tinge of jealousy that you never got a chance to beat the All Blacks after last week's match? Yeah big time. I, I, like, I, I've never cried after a game until we lost <laughs> the All Blacks in 2013 in the last minute. Um, yeah what happened I think the game was pretty much won and then we were picking and going to try and see the clock out. Nigel Owens did one of the lads for coming off his feet which was bloody har mm. sorry, harsh call because, you know, there'd been loads of, loads of those instances in the game and then the All Blacks kept the ball for four and a half minutes, scored in the corner. Yeah. That took it to a draw and then we got done for charging the kick early yeah. and they missed the kick but they got to do it again. So, yeah, so I cried, definitely cried after that one. Wow, and that was another match one I, in Aviva. Yeah, 2013. Yeah, that was heartbreaking. I think the whole country <clears> called <throat> you there, Mike. Yeah, yeah. So uh, but it was great to see him go on 
and take the learnings and you know win in 2016 in Chicago. Just mm -hmm. unfortunately, I wasn't there. So, uh, yeah. yeah, but it's still amazing even to get to play against the All Blacks. Yeah. I yeah. played sevens for the last couple of years, and I always wanted to line out against the All Blacks, mm -hmm. and I never got a chance. We played them a couple of times, but I would have picked up a knock or I didn't get selected yeah. for that. Joey played six games in a weekend for sevens, yeah. and I never got to line out against the All Blacks, which is. It's so annoying, but yeah. it's, it's such like a pinnacle, I think, to play them. So it's you might not have got the win, but it's still very yeah, good yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, but I, I tell you what, I've never. That's the most shattered I've ever been in a game. Like mm -hmm. I, I only got on, I think, twenty or thirty minutes, but I've never played at a pace that fast. And yeah. when they kept the ball for four and a half minutes at the end, just how ruthless and uh, you know how good they are, the pace they play at, it's. Uh, yeah, Something it's, else, isn't uh, it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's scary. But. I know. Yeah, I've been really it's, lucky to play against um, New Zealand myself. I think I've actually played them seven times in the World Series, and it's the, one of the hardest matches, all of them, that I've ever played in. It was actually only my third cap against New Zealand. It was pretty intense, but great experience, yeah, great learnings, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. playing the best in the world. Like, you did, can't... You, did you enjoy the hacker? Um, do you know what, sevens, they don't actually do the hacker, so I never oh, actually got to experience so, okay, it. We only yeah. got to see it. Um, at the end they do, don't At the oh, end, yeah, so, so yeah, when yeah, they got, yeah. when New Zealand, the women, they always reach the final oh, okay. and uh, they did the hacker. Yeah, it's yeah. great to watch. Class. Yeah, intense, they do it at the end and they win. They play yeah. at a different level down yeah, there in the Southern yeah. Hemisphere. Uh, but another <coughs> kind of condition, a different level of rugby is out in the sports ground where you spend plenty of years, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a question in from Michael O'Grady. He wants to know what your favourite kind of memory is. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Probably our first, I think it was our first uh, Heineken Cup game against Harlequins. Actually, I remember it well because we'd had a really, really tough season. We, I think we went on a 10-match losing run. Mm. And so, you know, when you've lost a number of games in a row, it's, it's a pretty dark place to be in, in terms of, you know, leading into the week. You know, you've lost again, you're reviewing the game, everyone's down in the dumps and nothing's really going for you. And, uh, you yeah, know, we had this game against Harlequins at, at, at the sports ground. You know, packed out sports ground, that great atmosphere, and it, yeah, we won. We beat a really good Quinn side, and it was just, I think, just the relief and the emotion to have won a game after losing ten games. It just kind of, yeah, it was amazing. So, yeah, Incredible. that was a great day at the sports ground. Yeah, and a personal question from me is: you had time with Connacht and time at Leinster. Yeah. Mm. Which time did you prefer? Did you prefer playing it up in the RDS or oh, down the sports mate, ground? Oh, that's a tough. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, I, I loved both uh, clubs for very different reasons. So. Look, Galway as a place to live, absolutely amazing, fantastic, and great bunch of lads. Obviously, it's great to see that they went on to win, was it the league in 2016? Connacht. Connacht, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was great to see them do yeah. that, but you know, we didn't have that success when I was there, and I always thought when we were at Connacht, when I was at Connacht, we had a great starting 15, but if we kind of had injuries, we just didn't have that strength and depth, so kind of we, we always seemed to struggle a bit, but um, mm. it's great to see what they've gone on to achieve now. And I actually nearly joined Leinster the same time Sean Cronin and Fionn Carr joined. I'd, I'd been down to meet Joe Schmidt, John O'Gibbs, Guy used to be down at the hotel and I'd agreed wow. To, wow. to go. Um, and then went back and uh, yeah, got talked into staying by the lads and the coaches. And um, yeah, so I stayed for another two years before I actually, uh, I actually joined. So, Amazing. Yeah. Well, good thing you did because Greg touched on you got your first cap for Ireland when you were 29. Yeah. And, um, but how did you feel, actually, Noah Brennan asked, how did you feel about going out and singing the Irish national anthem? Well, just, yeah, I think it was just a massive relief that I'd finally got there in the end. But yeah. I started that game at six and I never got capped again at six after that. So, <laughs> um, yeah, um, obviously just the same for anyone who gets capped. You know, very proud, great mm. to have my family there. Uh, emotional day. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, just one of cherish and remember forever. Did, did you yeah. learn off the anthem? Uh, not really, no. I, you just kind I, of like mad well, and you No, no, I, I knew it pretty well, so yeah. I did, the girls yeah. had to teach me made the a good Irish fist anthem. Of it. I made a good fist of it, yeah. yeah. Did yeah. you sing the Irish and the English? Or? Both. Both? Yeah. I like I'm not singing it now though, no. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you actually used to play in the England 20s, is that right? Yeah, we were chatting about that before, yeah. so a lot of people don't realise that I actually was trying to play Ireland 20s before England. Mm -hmm. So I was at Wasps 2000-2003. I was flying over to Dublin to do the training for the Six Nations, but you know, not good enough. wasn't getting in the team, wasn't getting in the squad. So I was missing under 21s games with Wasps. Wow. So I kind of needed to be making a mark there, and so I I stopped doing it in the end because I was missing games for Wasps, and I wanted to get like a first team contract. Mm -hmm. So I stopped doing it, and then I think everyone just wants to play at the highest level possible. So then I got called up to the World Cup squad with England. So I was like, I jumped wow. at the opportunity, you know, as you say, as I said, want to play the highest yeah. level. 
But it was so awkward because we got we landed in Johannesburg or whatever it was, and then we're going through passport control, and Ireland are queuing up there, oh, I'm no. queuing up here. So there's a few oh, awkward stairs, no and then to top it off, we get to the hotel, and Ireland is staying in the same hotel, and I, I'm in the same hotel. But no, it was grand. Did you uh, get any stick from them? No, just no. friendly banter. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, no, it was all good. But I've had stick my whole career, yeah. so English lads give me grief for playing for Ireland. The Irish lads give me yeah. grief for having an English accent, so uh, you can I, never can't, win. I can't win. So, Would yeah. you ever be called the plastic paddy? Oh, pl I always yeah. call that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can probably understand where he's coming from with the whole learning the anthem and all that stuff. Maybe. Yeah, I was just saying, I yeah. the girls, a few nights before, I was getting my first cap, had to teach me. Oh, okay. Uh, teach me the anthem. Yeah. yeah. Ron Levine. Yeah. yeah. Even as an Irish I person, I was a little bit nervous it's before hard. singing it that yeah. I knew the words properly. And I remember a story, we're playing Irish 18 schools over in Madrid and our first match was against Portugal. And we're all standing there. It's all our first time singing the anthem for our country. Obviously, it's under yeah. 18 schools, but it's still a massive moment. Yeah. And we're all kind of nervous. We're not sure whether how yeah. loud to sing. We're all kind of looking at each other. And we go out and we play Portugal and we don't beat them that convincingly mm -hmm. as much as we should have come back in, instead of having a review of the game, we got absolutely murdered by yeah. Terry McMaster, the head coach, about how unpatriotic he, we all oh. were for not oh, singing serious. the anthem right. with pride. So we all, like, we all took that like really personally. Yeah. And uh, the next match we were out, I think we were playing France, and we all belted oh, out the yeah. national anthem, completely <laughs> sung our hearts out, and we ended up beating <laughs> France and getting into oh. the final. Oh, really? uh, and funny enough, that was star-studded teams at that 18 schools. Gail Fica was playing in the mm. centre for France. Yeah. Mara Toja was playing for England. Billy wow. Burns. Um, so yeah, it was a big stepping stone and learning curve to be more patriotic singing yeah. the anthem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, the next question for you, Mike, is, um, so you obviously touched on playing in the Aviva there in 2013, which is an amazing stadium, but what is the, your favourite stadium that you played out of Ireland? Uh, Millennium Stadium. So we beat Wales, I think it was 2012, maybe, um, yeah. in the Six Nations, and just, yeah, the, what is it, 82,000, I think, and it's, it's so like close that. to the pitch. They've got the goat out on the pitch as you run out. I don't know why I remember that, but they've got the little <laughs> goat. Um, Fireworks going off, off, and uh, was the roof closed over? Uh, I think it was open that day, but you can just like the, the crowd's so close to the pitch, you you just kind of really feel it on top of you. So, mm. yeah, we won that day, and that's the one where Zebo did the little chip off the side of the boot, and it yes. was a bit lucky, but it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. big lucky. Yeah, yeah. 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 he said he meant it. So, yeah, <laughs> but I, I remember what actually had, these memories are just coming into my head now. But okay. I was warming up, and I had a new pair of boots on, and they were just way too tight, and I had to, I just remember I had to go and change my boots during the warm up. So I was like. I was thinking, oh, this is the worst preparation for a test match, going off during the warm-up to change my boots. So. Yeah. Did you have spare boots with you? Oh, yeah, I always have spare boots, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That would so, yeah. be yeah. rare to bring spare boots. Yeah. Well, I think all Fords bring spare boots. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have the different studs, don't yeah, you? Yeah. Be prepared. 20, the 21s in, the 21s in, yeah. Mm. yeah. Would you be superstitious about having this two pair of boots, like two uh, weird, first sock on, uh, left sock, right not, sock, not something too, like that? Not too, ba oh, not too bad on game day. It's more during the week, just my routine of getting my mm. prep done and knowing I've done enough to kind of tick the box going into the game that saying, look, I couldn't have really done any more. So that would give me confidence. Yeah. Um, superstition wise, I used to, yeah, I used to have the, the smelling salts, you know, the smelling salts. So yeah. I had them tucked into my sock. Oh, really? And I think it was South Africa. Uh, so I was sniffing them after the anthem just to give you a bit of a buzz. Oh my God. And then I, I put it back in my sock, forgot I had the little glass bottle <gasps> tucked into my sock. And then I realized and I had to obviously give it to the physio or something yeah. 10 minutes into the game. Lucky it didn't break. Oh, exactly, yeah. yeah. Oh my God. I've never heard of insults before. Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. know when someone kind of gets knocked out, like semi-knocked out, and they come over and they, and they, they, and you hear, ah. see them jump like that? It's really like intense yeah. smell that kind of wakes yeah. you up. Yeah. Another question that's come in, who um, would be the toughest opponent that you've ever played against? Uh, well, there'd be a few. Um, mm. I remember as a young fella playing at Newcastle Falcons, can you remember Sebastian Chabal? Oh the, my God. The yeah. caveman, oh. yeah. Oh. So I was a young, a young fella playing one of my first games for Newcastle. We are playing against oh. Sale Sharks away. They had this monster pack back then, the likes of yeah, Chabal, Sebastian Bruno, Sheridan was playing. So it was a bit of a baptism of fire. And yeah, it was, oh, it was pretty scary playing against Chabal. He was just- his beard always in bit, the way. Oh yeah, he had the big beard, the, the hair down to here. And yeah, obviously he's a freak carrying the ball. Um, that was quite scary. Uh, back he's both, uh, Eben Etzebet, Jerry Collins was mm. uh, pretty scary to play against. Uh, yeah, scariest, person I played with was probably Trevor Leota at Wasps. Do you remember the <laughs> hooker? Okay. Uh, he was yeah. banned from tackling during training, thankfully. Um, he just be killing he? Oh, yeah. He's killing but, everyone. Yeah, so there was actually, I remember we had a video session after we, we lost a game and Warren Gatlin was given out to Trevor Leota saying, oh, you know, that's lazy Trev, you know, get up fast. And 
and everyone's just like sliding it down the chair going like this because Gats has given out to Trev and we've got a contact session straight after the video session. No way. So like we went out to the contact session and Trev was just absolutely ending people and then that's after that session one lad nearly got decapitated, Johnny Hilton, a fullback. And after that game, that's when Trev was banned from tackling in training. Oh my god. So, yeah. That is rare. Oh <laughs> yeah, my yeah, god. Yeah. yeah. Well nowadays it's contact has gotten so heavy uh, in, in World mm. Rugby that most teams don't even train contact during the week and they just leave it to the weekend. Yeah. It's, it's madness. Well, I think like, in the I think in the premiership now there's um it's been capped at it's I think it's twenty minutes or yeah, forty yeah, minutes right. full on contact a week, which is which is massive because mm. when I think back to yeah, I remember playing an under twenty ones game for Wasps, got sparked out in the game. And then I was training with the first team on the Monday and <laughs> doing full contact. So, so it was very different yeah. back then, different wasn't time, it? Yeah. Different yeah. times. Showing your age now, I'm like... <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Nearly 40. Oof. Yeah, uh, you're looking good for 40. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another lad who looks great for his age um, is Devin Toner. You're good friends with him. Dev 6'10". Yeah, yeah. 6'10", 6'11", he says, says he is. Yeah. Well, yeah. he's seven foot if he stands up straight, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had him on a couple of weeks ago, and um, Stewie Holland has uh, given us a question in relation to Devon Toner. Right. And he wants to know, did you actually wear Devon Toner pyjamas? Oh, so yeah, the, when I, I think when I retired, or <laughs> soon after retired, the supporters club at Leinster sent me uh, a Dev 6'10 t-shirt um, <laughs> with his kind of head on it. And then they sent one for my little girl as well. So no I've still got, yeah. So I, I was, I was doing a few podcasts and stuff, and I was wearing the Dev Six Ten T-shirt. And then I, I must admit, I wore it a couple of times for bed as well, which my <laughs> missus found a bit weird. <laughs> that is yeah. weird. Does he have Mike McCarthy pajamas? No, I don't. I, I'm, not, I'm not legend enough to get a T-shirt made for me, but uh, uh, yeah. well, make one yourself and send it to oh, me yeah, for I Christmas. Should do, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have to be a big one. Mine, but like, no joke, though. He's asked like, why are you not texting him back? Dev? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Dev is, yeah. I, I saw him. I went to visit him. He was... Isn't there Dev's, a picture on Instagram? Oh, yeah, yeah. Dev, yeah, and we're doing this for some reason. I don't yeah, know why. I've it's a bit that. weird. Well, now's but, your chance to apologise to him. Look down the camera. No, I don't need to apologise, but Dev... Oh, Dev, I'm sorry, and we are still friends. Um, but, yeah, Dev was obsessed with me seeing his new house because he's had a new house done up, and he's he's a bit of a show-off like that, and he was, like, he was mad for me to go and see his new house, and... Showing off, you know, he loves showing off, so, yeah. <laughs> Did you go and see the house? I went and saw the house, it was, it's, yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's like a palace. Yeah, um, and he doesn't even mow the lawn, he's got this, yeah, again, he was showing off again. He's got this electric <laughs> lawn mower, which you don't have to mow the grass, it just does it itself. So. Oh, the robot ones, I've yeah. seen them. Yeah. They're yeah. over in, they're actually, I, the yeah. la first time I seen them, they were in a dare manor at the hotel, these yeah. little robots. Well, do you know what did surprise me a bit, though? His oh. bed, I thought he'd have uh, kind of, specially made bed for him and it, it's just a normal size bed so when we went to the bedroom i said oh do you, like are your feet all right like are you comfy sleeping in there and he's like oh no it's fine it's just uh, i just get on with it so, so. <laughs> anyway mike yeah. back to a little sorry. bit of rugby sorry. um mm. moss downey would like to know if what it felt like smashing eden isabeth can you explain that story oh yeah uh yeah so yeah i'd said to you i was not very good at a lot of things but i think tackling was one of my strengths and yeah, I got a pretty good shot on Eben Etzebet, which actually, what a legend. He, someone asked him about that in a podcast recently, and he said, I think he said to Chris Henry or something, that he, he owes me a pint if he ever sees me. So I thought that was pretty cool. That is pretty but cool. Uh, yeah, we played South Africa at the Aviva, and um, I just remember that week. So I was actually not even meant to be in the, start, in the match day squad. Paulie was starting, and um, I, think I remember on the, so I, I was preparing, I was South Africa during the week. So Monday and Tuesday, I was doing, South Af I was running the line as if I was South Africa against Ireland. Against so Wallapan, I wasn't doing the yeah. Irish prep at all. And then it got to a Tuesday night, I think Paulie pulled me over and said, oh, oh Mike, I'm struggling here with my back, so there's a good chance you're going to be involved, which was really good of him because he could have waited till the next day. Of course, yeah. So I was like panic stations up to my room, kind of chucked the South Africa calls away, looking at the our calls, doing a load of prep, and um, yeah, found out the next morning, Decky told me I was starting. So already I was oh. thinking, oh, I've missed half the week's prep doing the Irish stuff. Um, so yeah, I ended up starting and yeah, I got man of the match that game. So oh, it, was, it was, I was big for me because it gave me a lot of confidence going forward after that, that you didn't need to do as much prep as you, you need to do. Yeah. Um, and yeah. There's probably a balance with it in that you yeah. hadn't been getting nervous all week because you were like, oh, yeah. I'm just doing South Africa calls and you weren't building yeah. up those nerves. And it was such a yeah. last minute call. Yeah. You just went in and played like your natural yeah, but ability. I, I definitely didn't sleep the night before in the Shelbourne. So yeah, but yeah, it sh just shows you that prep isn't everything, I suppose. What well, showed me anyway, so. Yeah, that's yeah. incredible. Um, next question for you, Mike, is Gareth would like to know if you had a favorite pre-match meal. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I was quite. I always went scramble, just your scrambled egg on toast for breakfast, and then leave it kind of three hours, not eat too much. What did I have? I just would have like chicken, pasta, no sauce, because the worst thing is when you're burping up a bit of, oh, oh. I don't know, curry or, oh. well, you wouldn't have curry. Tomato sauce or something. Yeah, something, yeah. yeah. So I tried to keep it pretty light and maybe have a, a protein shake, so yeah. to top myself up. I think mm. most rugby players that you would ask, I know in my experience as well, like you'd eat really, really plain foods, like plain pasta, yeah. plain tomato sauce, just because you are so nervous. And yeah. sometimes you wouldn't even eat anything, like a little yeah. bit of, Will Connors was on, wasn't he? And he was saying he only eats a bit of wheat bix yeah. Before a massive game like that. Yeah, exactly. I'd always have done my carb load for sevens weekend on yeah. the night before, and you just get so much pasta and yeah. rice and bread in, and then you're just trying to keep topping it up throughout, throughout the week. Did you ever right. play a bit of sevens, Mike? No? Oh, I did, yeah. Well, yeah. when I was at Wasps and I was a bit lighter and leaner and faster, I played in the Middlesex sevens, which is it's a pretty big, big competition at Twickenham. And we got to, we got to the final, and we. Um, Actually, believe it or not, I played two games on the wing for Newcastle Falcons. No way. Well, it was a massive injury crisis and a load of lads weren't registered, but I've still got a jersey that says 14 McCarthy on the back, which is pretty cool. Incredible. Oh, but yeah, played in the Middlesex Sevens and uh, we got to the final, but we played Bradford Bulls and oh, we got pumped in the final. They had the likes of uh, Leslie Vinicolo, Henry Poole, wow. uh, all, all those big names. So yeah, that was... Uh... But going back to the pre-match meal, I remember at Connaught, we used to go to the Radisson Hotel pre-game mm. And it was absolutely ridiculous. We go to the Radisson and they'd have all the buffet, you know, those metal tin things? Yeah. yeah. Like steak, salmon, pasta, like endless stuff. So lads would be going in. This is back in like 2004. So, you know, the uh, professionalism and all yeah. that wasn't where it is now. So lads were going in, absolutely filling their plates with tuna, tuna steak, uh, steaks. Mm eating a mountain of food and then like Peter Bracken was putting wrapping steaks in napkins, putting them in his fleece for later and stuff like that. No and way. then we go off and play a game and we were like, oh, <laughs> oh this is you, yeah, you, have some, uh, you have some good stories. Yeah, you? Yeah. It's only um, a few lads got sick on the pitch today back then. Well, I was just, yeah, you just felt lethargic and yeah, you, yeah. you couldn't help yourself, all this food in front of you and then you're playing in like three hours time. So yeah. they soon stopped it anyway. Um, Mike, Sean would like to know, um, how do you think the Irish team are going to get on in the World Cup? In a couple of years. Yeah. Six Nations have played before that. But. Yeah, well, it's, it's looking good at the moment, isn't yeah. it? Exactly. Like We've got real momentum. We beat England in March, um, hammered Japan. And I suppose when you look at that Japan game, you, you think, were Japan really bad? But then they pushed Scotland pretty close the other day. And they, they still had 11 or 12 mm -hmm. players from that World Cup squad who beat... Scotland and Ireland, so yeah, and they went really close to Australia the week before playing us. Oh, well, of course, like, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And then I mean that performance against the All Blacks was incredible. They left a load of points out there in the mm. first half, so they should. I think they should have been further ahead. And what I love about the team at the moment is two. Well, two things probably: the strength and depth we've got at the moment. When you look at that front row, uh, Porter, um, Tyg Furlong, Kelleher. And then you've got Kilcoyne and Healy coming off the bench. Fingers crossed we can keep those five and a few of the other lads fit because there's no better front row in world rugby, in my opinion. They're mm. big, fast, dynamic, powerful. They can all handle the ball. Yeah. They're all fit. They're absolute machines. Um, and, yeah, just, you know, like Robbie Henshaw coming in today, Bundy missing the game. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's just really, really exciting. I think we're in a really good place. And do you know what I think's been a, a massive plus as well is, so kind of everyone's looking talking about this progression in our attack from, from Joe, Sh Joe Schmidt days. And I suppose it took a bit of time to get there, but we've really seen it this series, the way we're playing, the width we're playing, the speed, playing to space. But Paulie O'Connell coming in, I think, has been a massive addition to the coaching ticket because mm -hmm. I think I think our breakdown suffered a bit, a bit after Joe, we finished with Joe because it wasn't as ruthless, dynamic, fast as it had been previously. So we weren't able to play the game we wanted to, but now Paulie's come in I'm sure that's kind of been the ingredients for making our breakdown back to what it was when, when Joe was in charge. And it's just complemented, it complemented everything. It seems mm. to have taken us to the, to the next level. So yeah, very yeah. exciting. And we just watched the Argentina game together. Obviously we record this on a Sunday. Um, Ireland scored over 50 points against Argentina, which was incredible. The eight wins in a row. It's been a really good place, as you mentioned there, Mike. And yeah. even before the game started, you, you, you mentioned depth. Jack yeah. Conan dropped out with a quad strain very early yeah. on today, which meant Peter Manny started. Kellen Doris went to eight. Nick Timney got phone called at eight o'clock this morning to come down from Sick. Belfast. Right. Yeah. Serious. So like, did you talk about the depth yeah. and the mental strength of these players to just be moved yeah. around and still play so well? Mm. So what did you make of the game overall, Mike? 
Yeah, well, it was the worst possible start, wasn't it? Because, yeah, they scored, Argentina scored after three minutes, didn't they? Yeah. But I, I was always thinking it's hard, it's going to be hard to find the same level of emotion and physicality that they had last week. It just, yeah. like, you can talk about it in the week, say we need to be at this level, but it's it's virtually impossible to get there again. Yeah. You were at the first half, actually, in the Aviva Stadium before coming to join us here, weren't you? Yeah, I was, yeah. yeah you um, so, the atmosphere. Well, right? the start was a bit flat because Argentina scored. Yeah. And, I mean, fair play to Ireland. They probably had a, a fair few Guinness after that All Blacks win. You'd have to <laughs> Celebrate, and they were, well, they were talking to the US president in the Shelbourne, weren't they? Incredible, so, yeah. yeah. Um, but good for them. It was an eight-day turnaround. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was a ruthless performance, and mm. I was chuffed to see Joey Carberry get a um, you know a good shift against a quality team, and like everyone's talking about, someone stepping up after yeah. Johnny, and look, we hope Johnny stays fit and, for the World Cup because he's immense, but he's 36. Uh, but well, someone Carberry needs. Got- Carby got man of the match, didn't yeah, he? And yeah, like, and, and that's exactly what I was thinking before. Yeah. Someone needs to step up like Sexto did with Rog in 2009. Someone needs to step up and say, oh, I'm, I'm next in line for the jersey. And like Joey's performance today was brilliant. It's great to see him come on against the All Blacks and see the game out. Three great kicks, one from the ha- halfway. Mm. And he just ste- steered the team around the park and, uh, you know, did did really well. Yeah. So I was delighted for Joey after yeah. getting so much stick the last couple of weeks. People were like, oh, he's not up for it. Like Harry yeah. Byrne, Ross Byrne, Jack Hardy should yeah. be in. Yeah. Where Joey yeah. just needed time to come back after his long injury. He's out for nearly two seasons. Yeah. If you said he came on against New Zealand, scored all his kicks, yeah. got man the match today. Yeah. He was just making breaks for fun. So I think he's back to yeah. where he is, um, where he used to be before he got hurt. And now the club game in the next couple of months is going to be massive for those guys to keep putting their hands up for the Six Nations then coming. Yeah. Um, and we're talking about the the pack. And the rolling mall is very impressive for me. What did you make of the yeah, rolling mall today? Did they get a couple of tries off the mall? They um, did. Josh yeah. Sandefier got two tries. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, All the tries came from the forwards this week. Right, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, any, yeah, any going up against Argentina who pride themselves on being physical, aggressive, set piece orientated, scrum, mall, defensive mall, you know, to be scoring mm. tries against them from the mall is, you know, that'll be a real positive, especially for the coaches. Mm. Um, and you know, any test match you play, it starts with the foundations you lay up front, you know, strong scrum, strong maul. And even looking back to last week against New mm. Zealand, the, the front five gave an absolutely unbelievable foundation. And same today, and that enabled, there was no changes really in the pack apart from, you know, the lads going off before the game. But that foundation gave the changes in the back line that enabled them to play off a, a pack that's going forward mm. and really kind of express themselves and play well. So. Yeah, you know another great, player yeah. I thought was really impressive today, Caelan Doris. What do you think of him? Oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah, I actually got it. I got okay. it completely wrong last week because I, I said, um, I said I would have started Tyg Burn at six and okay. Caelan Doris on the bench, but and then he put that performance in against the All Blacks. Absolutely incredible and good to see him back from his mm-hmm. kind of concussion troubles. And I mean, the work rate he gets through. He's a real athlete. The lines of the lines he hits in attack. That try he scored coming round the corner and yeah. coming back against the grain. Mm. He scored another great try today. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. you might have been under, in the taxi I, know, the I, way saw, over. I saw it, but I, I was worried he'd got a bit of whiplash off that because he yeah. ran a real hard line. And Massive he, collision. Yeah. And he yeah. just kept going, which just shows his strength at his age. Like, yeah. I think it was um, Matera hit him, which is yeah. he's been playing for years and he's an yeah, animal. Yeah, yeah. Gave him a full, nearly a shoulder charge. Yeah. We all went, oof, didn't yeah. we, yeah. in the yeah. studio? Yeah. And he yeah. just kept going. You could see when Caleb Darris yeah. got up after, though, he was like, yeah, because the lads were coming in to celebrate him with high fives. He's just like, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, second, yeah, yeah, he just, look, he runs hard, runs good lines, and, you know, those yards after contact you talk about, you saw him pumping the legs to get over. So, yeah, great, great player. Yeah, and really good. effective in the line-out. I think last week against the All Blacks, he, he robbed or frustrated and st- stole a fair bit of uh, New Zealand's ball. Yeah, he did, which, which is incredible. So, yeah. The yeah. Whole, everyone across the pack, I think, even yeah. off the bench is what you mentioned there a while ago, Mike. When yeah. the, I think previously with the Irish team, when the bench came on, it would get a little bit dull and yeah. like, is Ireland going to hold on here? Mm. But nowadays, yeah. guys are coming off the bench and it's just even raising the standard. But, I just thought it, it's incredible. But There's been some yeah. huge hits in the games. What about Thomas Lav- Lavini's... Red card. What do you think about that? The one today. Yeah. Yeah, I've missed it, but I, I've he's he has got a bit of a the, the bad rep. on he? uh, Healy, wasn't on it? On Healy. So Healy was uh, yeah. at a rock, and he was kind of on his knees, and Lavini just came in and yeah. just hit him yeah. with all his force, and, and Healy kind of went back over himself like that, right. and we, it looked like he was he was properly injured, and oh. then P- Peter Armani started screaming the head off Lavini. Yeah. But you you even knew when when I said Argentina got a red card, you were like, oh, was it that Lavini yeah. guy? So you think he's. He's well, been, like, done yeah, like he's, that look, as we said before, yeah. Argentina do play on the edge. They're f- they're physical. They've got a gnarly, nasty pack, and mm-hmm. he's probably the cornerstone of that. Well, the refs are really hot on it now. The, yeah. the high tackles and 
those, yeah. um, you know, reckless kind of tackles running into the rock are just not needed in the match. So yeah, of course, safety yeah. is a big thing. Yeah. 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 Any other standout players for you besides Joey? Craig Casey and Harry Byrne came off the bench. They were, they were a nice little partnership to see. Yeah, it's look, I was glad to see we didn't make wholesale changes because I think previously our third game's normally been against USA or Canada, so they've made wholesale changes. But, you know, given Argentina the respect they deserve, um, I thought Rob, Robert Balakun did, you know, did as well as he could. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, those to get those guys on and get minutes, and as I said for Joey Carberry, for him to get minutes and get mm. more comfortable in the system and put in that player of the player of the day performance, uh, you know, it's just great to blood yeah. new and younger guys who are obviously going to be there down the line for the for the World Cup. But yeah, think... Craig Casey looks so exciting. He's uh, oh, yeah. he's a bit like uh, Jameson Gibson Park in terms of that X factor he brings, sniping around the base of the breakdown and a front five's worst nightmare. Yeah. yeah, you think, well, Murray only getting 50 minutes and Craig Casey getting half an hour is amazing. Yeah. Um, but on, one thing that stood out for me for Ireland in the last couple of weeks, especially today when they were like 50 points up against Argentina, they were still so energised and they mm. really cared about the defence and yeah. they were all cheering at the end there, especially when... Um, I think Dan Sheen went in for a try and they're all just cheering and it's like, lads, you've yeah. got 56 <laughs> points. Like, it just shows how much yeah. it means to them. Even Peter Manny at the end there in his interview was saying yeah. how much fun they're all having, yeah. um, which is just a really good thing to say. So do you think they're going to bring that on to the Six Nations? Do you think we'll have a really good campaign in the Six yeah. Nations, Mike? Yeah, well, it's it, it looks positive at the moment. As I said, we've got real momentum from that England win, the, the Autumn Series. And yeah, that's I suppose that's a shift in perhaps mentality from looking back years ago that they are being that ruthless and playing to the final whistle. Mm. I know they've been working with a new um, psychologist who's been helping them with, because I think for the last World Cup they identified, or perhaps the last two, that perform performance anxiety mm. was a bit of an issue. So I know there's a, a new psychologist who's come in, been doing a lot of work with them, and you know they're playing kind of like New Zealand do or have done in the past, you know, they're so ruthless, they get ahead and they don't just sit back, they keep playing, they keep playing, they keep running hard, mm -hmm. uh, the energy's high, the body language is high, and that exactly what Ireland looked like. Yeah. So the signs are really good, we've just got to peak now at the, at the World Cup. Players like Dan Sheehan was really impressive today. Um, what do you think about him, Greg? Yeah, it's only his second cap came off the bench and he is so explosive. He's nearly up there with the back trees or how fast he is. I scored a lovely little try, very smart off the back of the mall. Another fellow that was really fast mm -hmm. and only his second cap is Robert, Robert Balakun. Didn't really get much time to run around today, but uh, I trained with him with the sevens team and he is incredibly fast and so skillful and um, so it's really good to see these young guys getting minutes and yeah. performing and um, so I'm so excited about the about the future of uh, Irish rugby for sure but another point we should probably we not get not get over excited about the Irish result Argentina did get a red card and that floodgates kind of opened after that and also their kicker Buffelli missed two or three yeah. easy kicks mm. um, so maybe the scoreline is a little bit generous it's still a great performance but we won't get carried away with ourselves yeah, yeah. And, he, he, he missed two in front of the post didn't he then correct Matteo Carreras the Fal I think he plays for Newcastle Falcons. He he dropped the dropped the ball, didn't he? Yeah. So, oh, he so they probably left thirteen points out there in the first half. He did. He yeah. made that lovely break, um, the winger, wasn't it? Yeah, that's and, it. Yeah. He did all he the He got really work. excited. Was yeah. about to offload it yeah, to yeah. the left, and then yeah. just dropped it there. Just yeah. Then he went the, off uh, injured. And he, and he, bless him, he was crying, which was, oh, was sad to see. So, yeah. 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 Exactly. And there was another stage when Argentina in the second half were in the t Ireland's twenty-two, and they uh, overthrew a line out. So there was a few opportunities yeah. there. Um, but look, Ireland's in a great place. Three wins from three. Eight eight wins in the last eight matches. So fingers crossed, it keeps going that way into the six. Nations. But yes. another match we have to mention uh, was England-South Africa, mm -hmm. which was a close on 27-26, I believe, yeah. to England. Marcus Smith with an unbelievable kick at the end, some balls on him as a young fella. Oh. Yeah, big time. And I think it was a pretty daring team selection from Eddie mm -hmm. Jones to, look, he went with two lads in the front row, uh, Bevan Rod, I think it was just his second cap, Sale Sharks uh, forward, and Jamie Blamire. Mm -hmm. uh, Jamie Blamire doesn't even start for the Falcons. George McGuigan starts for the Falcons at hooker. Um, so it was a bit of a baptism of fire to those two lads, and they really stood up and fronted up because mm. you know Eddie Jones could have called in Mako Vunapola, Billy Vunapola for that game, even George Ford, you know, for a bit more experience. But he didn't do that. I think he obviously saw the bigger picture of the World Cup coming up, realizing he's got to kind of blood these younger guys and take the risk, and the, ultimately the risk paid off because everyone was talking about how big, strong, and powerful South Africa are, and. You know, they, I think they maul off 80% plus of their, mm -hmm. their own lineup ball. Um, but they got no traction in that first half. They were getting penalised off the park by the referee. Um, they just didn't really get a foothold in that first half. And, you know, England played really well. Marcus, Spit, Marcus Smith mm -hmm. steered the ship really well. And 
did what he had to do and showed a bit of that X factor we're used to seeing for Quinn. So uh, it was, in the end, I think they were quite lucky to get a, yeah. away with it, but the penalty at the end, but, you know, uh, give them great confidence going forward. Well, England kind of set the tone from the get-go, didn't they? Uh, scoring only after seven minutes. Yeah. You know, Tulangi in the corner yeah, was yeah. a great way just yeah. to kind of get the game going. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah Tulangi hurt. He pulled his hamstring as yeah. well going in there in the corner. So, um, But he's one of the older heads in, in the back line yeah. at, at this time. Yeah. It's, what they kept saying on the TV yesterday was this New England like wave of young players, which you mentioned uh, some of them across the back line there and in the forwards. Yeah. Just, they're going to be a serious side to, to come up against in the Six Nations, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had a, well, a standout player for me was the fullback, Freddie Stewart. Oh, yeah. He was br just brilliant, especially yeah. under those yeah. high balls. I haven't seen a fullback in the England jersey as good as him under those high balls. Like, like yeah. really composed and confident. Like I loved what um, Eddie Jones said about him because he's a really big guy. I think he's six foot five. And Eddie See. Jones was saying he's like a lock playing fullback. And if he sure. if he puts any more weight on, he'll end up putting him as a lock. Yeah. <laughs> well, aerially he was unbelievable. He caught absolutely everything. Yeah. And he scored a really good try where he kind of bashed over. So yeah, um, I think he even from mentioned the rock. from the rock. Yeah. I think he even mentioned in his post match interview when he was getting man of the match award that he last time England played South Africa he was in a students bar drinking and watching Seriously? the game like. That's, yeah, right. Yeah. that's right. He was at um, Loughborough University, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, just for yeah. England though, going forward to the World Cup, I, I think it must be frustrating for England because if they they just can't keep too long, he can't keep fit. Yeah. You know, if yeah. they have him playing and he's fit, the damage he does off like a first phase, off a line out or or a scrum, he gets go forward. He draws in all the defence, so defences get pretty narrow. So there's space elsewhere. Yeah. Like he's such a massive weapon for mm. for England, and if he's not playing, I think they lose an awful yeah. lot from, from him not playing. Well, speaking about mm. defence there and South Africa getting split open, was twice in the match South Africa got caught up by the same set piece move from um, from the England backline. So Henry Slade twice picked oh. two different options. So initially they went over the top to Freddie Stewart, and they went down on the right hand side. And then yeah. in the second half they came right off a line out, mm -hmm. and Henry Slade hit the front door option. But it was the exact same move, and yeah. they went through uh, Delande and Am, which is mad. They're probably yeah. the best defensive partnership in the world since the World Cup. And for England to be splitting them open without two Lange yeah. is yeah, just true, is, yeah. is really impressive. Like South Africa. They like um, were doing a blitz defence, but kind of a lot of dog legs at the time. I think that's why it opened yeah. it up for England a good bit. But that's the way South Africa have always um, defended. They they get up in that kind of banana shape and yeah. they put the pressure. Up. That's what they did to the Lions team. That's how they won the Lions series. Mm. But England have seemed to pick them off. Unless South African guys are just getting a bit tired now. It's yeah. really yeah. uncharacteristic of the of the land they and Am to get yeah. split open in the middle there. So uh, it was really impressive tries, weren't they? Like. Yeah. Um, What's his name? Quirk. They call him Rafi Quirk. Rafi yeah. Quirk. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's at Sale, and it's so. Wait, this is confused because they got they got Faf de Clerk at Sale, and they've got Rafi Quirk, and I think yeah. the lads are calling him uh, Rafi de Quirk or something like that. Mm. So, yeah. what did you make of his try? Yeah. yeah well, it, it just showed his gas and how fast he is. Um, but he's, I mean, he's really exciting. He is. He's learning from the best. He's learning from Faf de Clerk at Sale Sharks, and so many similarities between the way they play. You know, for a little for a little fella, he's. Hugely physical, loves tackling. Yeah. Not you know not many scrum scrum offs really do, but you know he, he loves he loves the tackling. He's rapid. He's he's a menace around the breakdown. Yeah. Um, really good at sniping. Mm. So yeah, he's he's really exciting prospect. Yeah. I'm actually I'm not surprised that South Africa lost. I know it's only by like one point, but they have been on the road for like 18 weeks now. Like you said, they yeah. are probably a little bit tired. How do you think that the yeah. England forwards did against them in the set piece? Yeah, like we touched on it, but yeah, they've done, they've. They set a really good platform. I think England got the first couple of penalties mm. at scrum time, which would have been massive for confidence. But like you touched on there before, I think we are seeing not to take a gloss over like Ireland's performance last week. It was amazing, but mm. we are seeing those some of the Southern Hemisphere sides. They do look a little bit lethargic. It's been a long season. I think I saw heard a stat on the TV last night for the France New Zealand game. I think New Zealand have played ten games in twelve weeks in six different countries yeah. at the end of a season. It's uh, and now they've got to go back and quarantine before they can see their families. So, Intense. look, I wouldn't write the All Blacks off or South Africa off yet, but it's been great for the Northern Hemisphere yeah. clearly. And Contepomi yeah. was in here last week, and he was telling us how Argentina had the same thing for them. They've been away from their yeah. families for, families yeah, for weeks. Time. So not only is the physical challenge of playing international rugby mentally, they're away from their families. They're in hotels. Yeah. They're in bubbles. It's very tough, and it's probably why. Well, probably not why, but a big element why all the Northern Hemisphere teams won this weekend and all the Southern Hemispheres lost. Just mentally they all must yeah. be, mm. be exhausted. So kicking was a massive part of the England versus South Africa game. Andre Parlad 
basically kept South Africa in it with five kicks off the tee. Um, he was unbelievable. He had one kick from just out on the right side. I'd say it was about 55 metres, just sailed over. Those South African guys can just kick like crazy. Like Francois Stein at the back, he's been playing for 15 years for South Africa now, and he just yeah. kicks it from all over yeah. the park. But there was an incident that he was involved in at the end of the match, the 79 minute, probably the most dis biggest decision in the game. Enter the went off his feet, and then Francois Stein came in and put his knees on Marcus Smith's back. Penalty went to England, and Marcus Smith steps up and scores the winning kick by one point. Megan, do you think yeah. that England deserved the win? They were a deserving team yesterday, or do you think that was an unfair decision? Yeah, I think they were deserving of win winning that match because it was a bit reckless for him coming in on his, you know, off his feet into the rock, um, and it was just great to see Marcus Smith make that decision to take the points um, and win the match for them. Yeah. But yeah, I, I agree with the ref there. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I, th I think England deserved to win because I think they, they, sc they scored tries, didn't they? But South Africa didn't sc they scored one try, didn't they? Yeah. But um, yeah, I th and Marcus Smith, I think he banged one over. The first try was he converted from the touchline. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's uh, he's cool, calm, collective, does it under pressure. Um, he, he looks... He looks the finished article, but I think Pollard needs to change his studs because I think Denise he, he was still slotting them over and kicking long kicks to touch, but he kept slipping over, didn't he? Yeah, you yeah. That? yeah. yeah. yeah he, he needs did. to get the twenty ones in, like the front five. Yeah, <laughs> but he's um he's a really like you said he's really cool and collective, yeah. uh, Marcus Smith. But he's really lucky as well. He's so young, but he has the likes of Johnny Wilkerson coming in to see him in camp yeah. and give like one of the best kickers in the world. You know, giving him confidence, giving him tips. Exactly, yeah. You know, week in week out, like how lucky. For him to yeah. have that exposure to players like that. Marcus Smith said that at the end of his interview. Yeah. He said during the week he's kicking with Johnny Wilkinson. He obviously has Owen Farrell in camp with him, who's picked up an injury. But those kind of guys around him, he gave them basically all the credit. So he's actually yeah. modest as well as just being yeah. probably the best out half in England at the yeah. moment. Well, I think it's so important to have those kind of like mental figures in. Like mm -hmm. you look at Paulie now in the Irish setup, and you know he's brought James Ryan through. I heard Dev on last week's show yeah. saying that you know. For the first year, Dev wasn't calling the lineouts. He's just watching how Paulie does it, and took a lot of his learnings from that. So you know those past players that have been there and done it, keeping them involved and in mm -hmm. camp is is massive for bringing the the new breed through. I think. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, and thoughts on England going into the Six Nations now? Do you think they're the favourites? But France are playing well. Ireland are playing mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Um, oh, England. Did they finish fifth in the last Six Nations? They had a, you know, by their standards, it was it's not good. Hugely, yeah. hugely yeah. disappointing. So. Mm -hmm. They'll be all guns blazing, but you know I, th I have to think that it's it's. I think it's going to be a great Six Nations because Scotland looked good. Yeah, uh, France but Italy really. Exactly, yeah. France. Yeah. Well, they beat Uruguay, didn't they? Was it sixteen ten? But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not getting my hopes up too much on that one. But uh, yeah, uh, I think England are always going to be there or thereabouts. Uh, be interested to see how Wales go because they they've had they've been decimated by injuries for this autumn series. And you know, to, to win that last game will give them a lot of confidence because you know they're missing so many players. But uh, you know, I think you have to say Ireland are looking exceptionally good. Uh, France are looking exceptionally good. So mm. I'd go on those two as favourites with England and Wales closely behind. Yeah, and going into another amazing game, France v New Zealand. Like I don't think I had any nails left from last weekend, but last night's game was absolutely brilliant. France beating New Zealand 40 points to 25. Yeah. Um, it was absolutely electric, like especially from the crowd. And it was the first time that France have beaten New Zealand on home soil in Paris since 1973. Ooh. So it's been, I think, 21 years or 12 years since um, they've beaten them. But like, it, was, it was an absolutely brilliant game. What did you think of that? Yeah, it was a cracking game. Um, what a stadium as well, mm. that one. I, yeah, it's, uh, the atmosphere looked amazing. Did you see them doing the, uh, the old clap thing at the end? Oh, uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of kissing as well once they won. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, it was a great game and look, France looked really good. For the All Blacks, loads of kind of uncharacteristic mm. mistakes in the first half, like dropping the ball, knock-ons, uh, overrunning each other. just didn't look like the All Blacks. And like yeah. we said, perhaps that uh, lethargic tea, yeah. side of things coming into it, but then... I was worried for France because it was an 18 point deficit at half time and they got it back to within two points. And I was thinking, oh, here we go. But, mm. uh, you know, France did enough to, to hold them out. It looked really good, you know, exciting backline. What's the fly off's name? Who made that ridiculous break? Um, Roman Intermac. Intermac, yeah, yeah. From, the, from, from behind the try line. So um, French, isn't it? Yeah, the, the little offload. The try zone, the little offload around. around the back. Yeah. Uh, amazing. Jouet, jouet. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Um, but yeah, France have you know they've got such a big physical pack. They're always going to have that kind of set piece mm -hmm. dominance, which 
allows that back line they've got to go out and, uh, and, and play. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're incredible. In fairness to New Zealand now, they were just a little bit off the money. I felt defensively they were missing tackles that they'd never missed before. Mm. Like one stage at New Zealand 12, the uh, New Zealand player or a French player came around the mall and the 12 just went in and just like kind of let it happen. That, that's yeah. so uncharacteristic yeah. of New Zealand guys. So I think they just need to go home, recoup and, and get some rest and come back again because it just it doesn't look like the New Zealand team that we're all used to watching. But yeah. what do you think is going to happen with there? Do you think there should be a new coach going in there? Maybe Joe Smith? Well, the, yeah, the, the, the media is out after them. I've, I've read a couple of headlines on the way, on the way over today yeah. and... Yeah, they've lost. When do the All Blacks ever lose two two on the bounce? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they're 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 after the Ian Foster's. I think hasn't he recently resigned to stay on for a, a couple of years or something? So, um, look, I don't know if they're going to change a coach, but you, you have to say it'll be a. It looks like a a bit of a. If they do change a coach, mm -hmm. you know, Joe Schmidt. I think he was in the running for it previously. So, um, I think he'd do wonders uh, with the All Blacks. So yeah, yeah it seems like a good fit for me if that happens yeah. but I don't think we need to throw the uh, what's the worst what's the saying baby out the bath or at the moment because I <laughs> yeah. think yeah and also so going back to the defense the All Blacks are defending with a new system which they've never defended with before so that's something Ian Foster changed so there will be a bit of adaptation getting used to that and yeah. uh, I they still had moments of brilliance where Savea's try where he just barged over with about three French people hanging off him it was incredible yeah. Yuani's try yeah. where yeah. he just went through the middle on a counter attack went through the middle went around yeah. the second row in under the post so they still yeah. had moments of brilliance yeah. but I'd say maybe it's just the new defensive systems and things like yeah. that and the travel was what we yeah. talked about yeah. um, they, just they, they can yeah. just score out of anywhere I mean you saw last week against Ireland I mean, they were, they were only in our half, I think, twice in the, in the mm -hmm. whole game. The first, what, they did a cross-field kick and nearly scored that amazing tackle by Gary Ringrose and... Um, Andrew Conway. Andrew Conway. So they nearly scored there. And then the other one was a line-out appeal around the back and uh, there was a gap between, I think it was Andrew Porter and Ronan Kelleher. And yeah. they went through and scored. Just, they're, they're ruthless. They can kind of create yeah. something out of nothing. Like, especially uh, 13, Rico, his try was got New Zealand back into the game yesterday when he created something out of absolutely nothing, sidestepped three players, um, pinned his ears back and just the pace yeah. onto the ball and then and got New Zealand back on the yeah. on the scoreboard was really, really good. Yeah, I don't think the, there's no real worries about New Zealand. Two years yeah. out from the World Cup, they'll sort it out. You can't write them out. off, like, yeah, of course yeah. not. do you know? Yeah. yeah. So we'll move on to the another amazing game of the weekend. Jeez, we were very lucky with the rugby, weren't we? Yeah. Wales versus Australia, yeah. another one-point game, similar to the England-South Africa game. Uh, Reese Priestland kicked it at the end to to beat uh, Australia. So I actually felt sorry for Australia. I just, I, I just thought they were playing really, really well. What did you make of the game, Mike? <laughs> Yeah, I think Australia uh, were fuming after the game, weren't they? Mm. Because a few decisions, but and, and a fair play to Australia. They had the red card pretty early. One stage, uh, they were playing with 13 men because uh, someone went to the... Curly Bill went to the bin, didn't he? Yeah. Um, but, you know, they still outscored, I think, three tries to two. So they put up a, a really good fight and it, you know, came down to the wire. Um, mm. So another cracking game, but another one for the, for the Northern Hemisphere. Mm. Um, but I think for, for Wales... He'll take, they've had the hardest mm. of the Northern Hemisphere teams in terms of they've played the big three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, great for them, for Wales to finish on a high with that, with that victory. And, but yeah, that will give them confidence going into the Six Nations and uh, you know, a load of players to come back for, for Wales. So, mm. yeah. Of course. Australia have been kind of hit and miss from the last few games, haven't they? But they got onto the scoreboard really early with the first try from Andrew Kellaway. He's the number 14. He's been shortlisted for player, uh, newcomer of the year, actually, from World right. Rugby. And he was like really good. Yeah. What do you think of the back three? He Greg? can't stop scoring, yeah. uh, that guy. It was early on as well, he a little kick through, and he went straight onto the ball. He's incredible. They had another uh, great try there, 11. Um, Dagunu, I think his name is. It was a really good uh, Australia team try. So they're they're always really good, Australia. Mm -hmm. They just step up to the mark. And I think they were a little bit unfortunate with getting, in my opinion, the red card. I don't know if you saw it, Mike. Where it was mm -hmm. you, the guy came in high. He did come in with a shoulder, but it was more of a head and head. Oh yeah. And he got a straight red card. What did you think of that? Well, yes, plain red card. It looked it yeah. looked it looked terrible. To be fair, I mean, was it Beard? He, you know, his cheekbone was bleeding. Or it's, uh, yeah, it was clearly high, reckless, and by the. By the letter of the law, it's a, it's a red card. I mean, it would have been a red card before the rules changed, I think. So yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any complaints. 
Rob Valenti, yeah, that was his name that got the red card, yeah. only after 15 minutes, but yeah. obviously by the letter of the law and to keep people safe, but I just think nowadays a red card just completely nearly just writes off a game. If, if one team goes down a player, the way the systems are and how tactile a game is now, mm. it's just like, all right, that's the game over, you know who's yeah. going to win, but in fairness to Australia, they only lost by a point in the last, exactly, yeah. the last minute of the game, so maybe I'm wrong, I just feel yeah, like yeah. it's, it's kind of going that way. And then there was this, a moment when Wales scored a try and there was a slap down that I... I was thought, and everyone else thought really on the pitch that it was going to be called back because everyone literally stopped. But Nick Tompkins ran on with the ball and scored under the post. Did you see that moment? I, I saw it, yeah. I know the Australian team just froze and uh, it was a free run in. And I think uh, Wayne Pivak mm -hmm. after was saying, oh, you've got, to, you've got to play to the whistle, you've got to play to the whistle. But uh, mm. yeah, I think, yeah, it's, uh, it's a blatant slap down. But then the question is, does it go forwards or backwards? I think it goes backwards, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so, by the letter of the law, is, yeah. it, is that a deliberate knock, slap down? I, yeah. I'm not sure. Well, I think Nick was really surprised because he was shouting at the ref, it went backwards, it went backwards. Right. And uh, yeah, everyone was just standing around like he yeah. was so confused. Yeah. It's just one of those moments that has been called back so many times. We've all yeah. played in rugby games. We're like, all yeah. right, knock on. Yeah. And the ref just mm. went with his gut there, which yeah. you probably yeah. like, fair enough, ref will done. A lot of other ones would have gone to the TMO or just blown it up, yeah. which everyone would have accepted. So, um, uh, letter yeah. to love, as Mike, as you said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. probably got it wrong, but uh, yeah, but <laughs> that's test match rugby. Like one mistake, it normally costs you. So, uh, mm -hmm. like I know Dave Rennie was uh, fuming after the game, but hopefully he's not going to take to Twitter to. Uh, uh, yeah, discuss it. I think we actually have a quote from what a, a quote from Wallabies coach Dave Rennie, who you said was livid. He said. Um, I thought some of the decision making tonight was horrendous and played a big part in the result. We'll get an apology next week, but it won't mean anything. Mm. So he's definitely not a happy camper. Mm. And, but like you wouldn't be if you lost by one point at the end of the game. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. and the ref's just doing his job and you can't be going at the refs as we saw with Razzy Rasmus getting a ban, which we'll talk about later. And before we get to that, another big game we're going to talk about is Scotland versus Japan. Mm. And what did you make of that game, uh, Megan? Um, I thought it was really close. I was really surprised. Like you said, Japan actually played really well. We can't write them off. Um, Scotland had had a good had a good game. What do you think? Yeah, for me, I, w I was thinking about Ireland because for me, mm. I think I touched on it earlier. It just made me realise perhaps how good that first performance was against Japan, where we we hammered them and everyone was saying, "Oh, Japan were really poor," but actually, I think Ireland played really well because mm -hmm. Japan pushed Scotland it was I think there was only six points in it wasn't there towards the last kind of five minutes so shows you know Scotland at home are a, a, a great team but uh, it was an exciting game you know some uh, a nomination for a try of the season I think isn't there in there so uh, you know fit, Scotland love fizzing the ball around Hogg is an absolute nightmare to defend against and Japan play that exciting brand of rugby throwing the ball around as well so uh, it was a good really exciting game to watch. Yeah it was a great game 29-20 and as you mentioned like I even myself thought oh Japan only but like mm. Ireland didn't go that well against them but Ireland obviously really did because Japan put it up to to Scotland and there were some great moments in the game with Stuart Hogg getting the t record for most tries for Scotland. Yeah because right. he was 25th uh, try for Scotland. Yeah. It doesn't sound like that many, but it's quite a big record for them. I was surprised when they said 25. Yeah. Like, 25, sure. Is that it? Yeah, but that is a great yeah. moment for him. Like He's the captain of Scotland. He just brings such big energy. Mm. I don't know if you ever got to play against him, Mike, did you? Well, a few, when I was back, back in McConaughey days, um, and he was playing for Glasgow, and then, yeah, I had a few games when I played against Scotland, he would have been playing. So, yeah, he's just a nightmare to defend mm. against. You know, every time as a front five forward, you, you know, you're out in space, the ball's been in play for a long time, and you just see him and... You just look and see who's either side of you, hoping that you've got someone either side mm. of you, because his foot, his ability to mm. not slow down and change direction, it's uh, it's, it's pretty hard to defend. Mm. So uh, there was actually um, the, one of the props, uh, Javan Sebastian. He was making his debut for Scotland, and yeah. he actually previously played for the under 16s and under 18s Wales team. Um, but he was starting off yesterday, but he was actually missing the birth of his firstborn child oh, because sorry. he was getting his um, debut for Scotland. So you can imagine what he was thinking in his head. Yeah. Like he's literally his wife in having a baby and he's getting his first cap no for, for his country. Yeah. Oh, that's mad, isn't it? Yeah. He, chose yeah. Getting, he chose getting his first cap. I know, of his wife will be thinking, I'm going to kill him. Oh, my God. <laughs> 
the Wi Fi probably went with yeah. no, go play the game, it's fine. <laughs> Where is really no stay here. <laughs> so he must have been wow. nervous, but he had a great game. He came yeah. on in like 60 minutes and he was really Shame great. he didn't get a score to do the old celebration. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, well, Scotland scored some unreal tries in that game, as you mentioned with Stuart Hogg, with Darcy Graham, mm. who didn't get the selection against South Africa the previous week, so he kind of had a point to prove. He had a great finish. He stepped in off his right foot and beat three J Japanese fellas, sent them into the stand. Yeah. Um, we do in Van der Merwe, who put Scotland ahead first after five minutes. So they're in, they're in great shape, Scotland. That's another great team in the Six Nations now. Yeah. Like All the games are going to be good. Really. What do you make of Scotland at the moment? Yeah, no, especially when they play at home. They're, they're really exciting play. You know, a really exciting brand of rugby to watch on the, on the Townsend. And, you know, it's a shame they didn't kind of win that. They, they won the first game against Australia, I think, didn't they? And then they lost quite heavily to South Africa. Mm. But, um, you know, they've taken some big scalps over. They beat France, uh, the last Six Nations, away from home for the first time in a long, long time. Mm. So they're making some exciting strides. Uh, I think where Scotland normally struggle is, it's, it's, it's we speak about that set-piece foundation. It's yeah. probably uh, the front row where the, they struggle a bit in, during the Six Nations. If, if they've got a front a uh, fit front row, they can compete, but once they start getting a few injuries, I don't think they've got strength and depth, and it's really an area that yeah. teams tend to get yeah. on top of them. Yeah. They have some serious stars, like start, put through the team, start, star sort of through the team. I'm yeah. sorry, chipping mm. on my words there. We have yeah. Finn Russell at 10, you have yeah. Stuart Hogg at 15, you have Duan van der Merv on the wing. They have some great players, but as you mentioned, Mike, when they go down, who's next? Um, yeah. Where I think that's where Ireland have now start, sorted out, mm. where they have nearly 40, I think, people trained <coughs> for this Autumn Nation series out in um, Carton House, just the strength and depth we have. So yeah. I, for one, cannot wait for the Six Nations to see yeah. all these matches coming up, except for maybe the Italy one. And who actually won on the weekend against Uruguay, but against Uruguay, do you know what I mean? We would argue with their second nation team or third nation team going up against a Six Nation team like Italy, who won 17-10, losing a 16-game losing streak, which must have been going on for a couple of seasons now yeah. at this stage. So what yeah. do you make of Italian rugby at the moment, Mike? Yeah, well, I, I said I'd, I've been on a 10-match losing run, which is horrific. So, uh, yeah, 16 matches, it's, um, yeah, that's pretty dark. So, yeah, it's, there's been questions asked, you know, should there be a kind of a playoff with other teams like Georgia to get into the Six Nations? And it's hard to know what's the right decision, but the longer it continues where they're just shipping, you know, loads of points in a Six Nations game, it's yeah. it's not a great spectacle, is it? Mm -hmm. So I think hopefully from Italy's point of view, there'll be some sort of progression going into this Six Nations. And if not, it's probably really time to do something about it. I'm not sure yeah. what the right thing is, but perhaps a playoff with, with another nation is, is the way to go. Yeah, maybe. Well, we put our hat tips our hat to Uruguay, 17-10. They were in seven points for the majority of the game against Italy. Yeah. And they can't have the same amount of funding as uh, Italy do. So, yeah. in fairness, yeah. Uruguay, they did well, scored a nice yeah. try. And, um, yeah, good to yeah. see, a, like, a, what you call them, a second-tier nation doing, mm. doing really well. So there were some incredible um, tries from this weekend, and we have some really great nominations. So let's have a look at some of them that we've put together. Three, um, three nominations for you guys, and, Mike, you get to pick the winner. <laughs> um, so the first one, like you said, Stuart Hogg's 25th um, try for Scotland. Um, he showed up in three different times for Scotland, you know, broke from their inside half and kept the ball alive. And he finally scrambled through um, for this try here. Yeah. It wasn't the best try, it wasn't that exciting. But um, it was nice for him to get the bit of nomination because it was his 25th try. He's actually got the record for Scotland. It was more the context around yeah. that try, which was really nice for him and for Scotland. Um, did you see it? The, yeah, the I think... I think the fact it was a real team try, so it started yeah. kind of in their own half and went through a, lo a load of phases. He started it and he finished it. Yeah. And, you know, some of the forwards run, run some really good hard mm -hmm. lines, great interplay between the backs and forwards, offloading kind of before the tackle, through the tackle. Um, and they, you know, they were... They, they kept all the ball for a long period, kept chipping away, and it was just a really good team try. Yeah, um, another... Great try was Rafi Quirk, we mentioned earlier, um, with that set-piece move off the line-out, he whipped it out to Henry Slade, they broke in the middle and he uh, finished it off. And did you see that try? That was a, yeah, that was a nice one. Yeah, so it started from the line-out, good throw by Nick Dolly on his first cap as well. Um, mm. And yeah, just a really well-worked try in terms of they picked off that South Africa defence, obviously identified during the week that there was a space or a gap there, the way they defend and, you know, they just got, South Africa just got picked off clean and Rafi Quirk, you know, ended up running running uh, half the length of the pitch. Yeah. So, yeah, really nicely worked try. 
His speed was very impressive mm. as well, wasn't it? Yeah, he's rapid, isn't he? Yeah, yeah nearly he's as fast, fast as you yeah. back in the day. Back, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a, a third nomination yeah. is from Filippo Danguno, the number 11 for Australia. I thought this was an unbelievable mm. try. It was the uh, number 12 for Australia, Hunter Paisami, uh, made a break and Australia worked it out and the 11 went down on the left. So I thought that was a, it was a great one. Great and finish. there he is finishing. Uh, it was a good finish, but... What did you think of it, Megan? Yeah, it was great finish. Like I wasn't. They went back with the team out to see if he got that, but it was some dive, wasn't it? I yeah. think it was going to land on his head, but it was really great finish from when we got like it's yeah. something that I've never been able to do. I used to always fall on my face. <laughs> I didn't yeah. score many tries. Yeah, so I, think, yeah, I know. Yeah, I haven't but... many. Like, so who was your favourite try from those nominations? Which one are you going to Yeah, they're all, they're all pretty good, weren't yeah. they? But I think just for Stuart Hogg, uh, for the special occasion it was, mm -hmm. and, you know, the, it was a team try. Uh, the togetherness they showed, you know, the lines are running, the interplay, as I said, uh, just a fantastic team try. So, yeah, yeah. I'll, pick, I'll pick that one. Um, uh, yeah, I'd agree with you 100% yeah. with Stuart Hogg, but uh, one other thing I want to mention just as a rugby nerd was um, <laughs> Mbipi's try. I don't know if you saw it when... Um, um, caught, did a catch pass. It was incredible. If you want to go back as a rugby nerd, watch his pass. They, the young keys flung it out to him. He caught it and moved it in one movement and whipped it out to Man Peepee over an English yeah. defender. So I just want to tip my hat to that as a rugby nerd. It's unbelievable it skills from Am. Um, so moving on to the jukebox now. Um, Tyg Furlong, he had a great game against Argentina. It was great line speed and put a lot of pressure on the Argentine player to knock him right back. It was a huge hit. Yeah, it was a great tackle. Tyg Furlong is, can do it all, can't he, Mike? Oh, yeah, that was, it was, uh, yeah, it activated beast mode. But uh, yeah, no, he just identified who was getting the ball. He got real good line speed, real good body position, and just, he's so big and powerful, he just absolutely smashed him. So mm -hmm. uh, that's, yeah, he's so physical, Tyg, mm -hmm. isn't he? I mean, the, the, was it 2018 when they beat the All Blacks and he was ragdolling the All Blacks, uh, yeah. throwing lads around the pitch. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, he's he has a beast. That, he has that farmer strength. Oh, he yeah. does, yeah. yeah. He does, yeah. And our next contender for Jukebox of the Week is from the England-South Africa game. We had Dwayne Vermeulen and Lou De Jaeger teaming up on a double tackle against Tom Curry. <laughs> Two beasts going up against a the beast there, but uh, it was unbelievable. There were so many hits in that game, but that was a really standout one for me. Tom Curry getting put back in his arse. That doesn't happen very often. Yeah. I think there was another big one in that yeah. game, wasn't there? Uh, there was another one from Enche. He was absolutely demolished, uh, Bave and Rod, on a huge tackle near his try line and uh, ended up securing a penalty for the South African side. Yeah, for me, that would be my vote, just because it wasn't just a massive hit, but it was also a great read out of a big guy, Enche. Yeah. And uh, as you said, the penalty came after it. So that's yeah. my vote, but huge. I don't know what you think. Can I just mention, actually, talking about beasts, um, Greg, you actually met the Beast on the weekend. Have you seen this on Instagram? Oh, I saw some of I've been dying to say it together, this whole yeah. podcast. He was doing hot yoga yeah, with the Beast. Saw, yeah. Well, please tell <laughs> us about it. And he's pretty it. flexible, isn't he? Yeah. 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 For a big man. Yeah. 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 And yeah. you had the tight leggings on and everything. Like, you looked class, yeah. but like, it was. Yeah. Um, so you went over to, because um, you're living in the UK now. And um, you're doing a documentary for the World Rugby, is that yeah. right? So people who don't know who the Beast is, yeah. it's Tendai Matarira. He played for South Africa, he retired last year. World Cup medal, um, if you look up the Beast of South Africa, <laughs> you'll know exactly who he is. Uh, he came over to the England-South Africa game and I'm doing a documentary kind of series for World Rugby for World Rugby's fittest uh, sessions or hardest sessions. Yeah. And uh, hot yoga is one of them. So I had the hot yoga pants on, like all colorful floral, the yeah. headband. Yeah. And he came along and uh, I have a kind of a background in yoga and Pilates and I'm also a quarter of the size of the beast. So I found it a bit easier than him, um, but a great guy to meet, an absolute legend like meeting Mike McCarthy on this oh, yeah, yeah. show. Um, <laughs> Were you taken back how big he is? Because he, he is massive, isn't he? He's massive yeah. and he's put on weight since he finished uh, uh, rugby, yeah. so he's even bigger now. Yeah, yeah. But um, Anyway, sorry, sidetracked you there. No, yeah. let's just pick a winner from the jukebox. Yeah, what I, do you think? I, I'd love to pick Tyg Fung, but I'm going to go with the Ox as well because he. Yeah. Well, I love the name as well. He, he oxed Bevan Rod, so Bevan Rod. <laughs> I think it was only his second cap, bless him. And I, yeah, I remember the picture of it. So Bevan Rod was running. He was the only option for the yeah. for the nine to hit. So normally you have three forwards, and you go. Mm -hmm. you, you can hit either of the three forwards. So if you're sending one forward up. Uh, it's easy to read in defence, so they are able to get the line speed, get off the line, and yeah, he didn't even wasn't even able to wrap the arms because it was so powerful. He sent them back flying. So yeah, uh, yeah it has to be that for me. Yeah, it's my vote as well. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you, lads, definitely. Um, having a look at some of the other news from the world of rugby, there's been lots of going on in the last couple of weeks. So the big talking point is uh, Razi Erasmus ban from South African rugby. Um, you know, he was banned now for two months from all rugby activities, including match day activities, all the way up to October 22. 
What are your thoughts on that, Greg? Yeah, it is It is a major talking point. I think it's four months after the Lions tour. It's about four months now yeah. since it happened. It took, yeah, that's, that is the shambles of it. It took four months to get to that decision. Really? And he's been coaching every day up until then. Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah. So what do you make of it, Mike, being a professional rugby player yourself? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's the right decision mm -hmm. because, you know, if you look at, for example, that Wales-Australia game, Dave Rennie voiced his opinion after the game, but imagine you've got all the coaches in all the different leagues after internationals going to Twitter to give their opinion on the ref's performance. Look, at the end of the day, the refs are human like the players mm -hmm. and they make mistakes. And, you know, they've got families, they've got kids. And the last thing we want to do is encouraging this kind of hate on social media. Um, so look, I, I think, I, and I think he's quite lucky because apparently World Rugby wanted the ban to be longer. And I think that they wanted the ban to last until the next World Cup. So mm -hmm. I think they, <laughs> It's probably not really happened before, so they've gone out and said, "Look, we need to set a precedent on this that it's not going to happen again." And um, make an example out of him a little you know, bit. Yeah, I think it's uh, yeah, I think it's good for the game because rugby's mm -hmm. built on uh, you know its foundations are respect, aren't, aren't they? So that's you know probably it's the right huge. decision. He was fined as well, twenty thousand. Yeah, well, SA yeah. Robbie was fine, 20,000. Yeah, was it SA Robbie? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I love the little Razzy Erasmus masks in the, uh, yeah. the Twickenham. Um, and then he put a video of him drinking a pint of Guinness on Twitter as well, but oh, it looked like a so. horrific pint of Guinness anyway. So. <laughs> it's almost social media is just a thing now, even at that level mm. of professionalism. Um, but he yeah. claims that he didn't mean for it to go viral and that he yeah. just made the video, oh. but it got sent out some way but he didn't do anything to stop it like he didn't take yeah. it yeah. down well, after so yeah um look it's great to see them putting a bit of a what a, a ban on that kind of stuff and like put a smackdown on it and it uh, won't be happening again as you said mike because that would just make a farce of the whole situation wouldn't it yeah and i suppose if coaches are doing it then it encourages the players to do it as well and yeah. you know you can't have players putting you know decision making up on mm. after <laughs> a game it's, it would just escalate and get ridiculous so it's yeah. definitely the right decision and you know just you know, Razzie's obviously an amazing coach and what he achieved winning the World Cup, uh, you know, because he's high, pro high profile, I assume they've obviously just looked to set an example by it. Yeah, exactly. And another talking point is your teammate here, Griffin. You played with her, I'm sure, did you? Yeah, I was really surprised. Um, so the Irish women team were playing Japan yeah. and they beat them narrowly 15-12 Came this from weekend. behind, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was a really close match. Now, the weather wasn't great, the ball was slippery, and you know yourself, kind of like the nerves and with it was the last match for the Autumn Series for the girls and Kira Griffin, she's the captain and she has been um, for the last number of years. She's a huge part of the Irish squad, uh, very popular figure and she's absolutely, I've been so lucky to play alongside her um, over the last few years and she's only 27 yeah. and she's um, announced her retirement. I think it's right so, like she's ready to have a little bit of a break. Mm -hmm. You know yourself, like Reg, you've just retired, you're 27 too, you know, yeah, 26, there's, 26, old, 26 sorry. there's life outside of rugby, you know, she's a personal trainer, she's a farmer and she's like really passionate with other things and like rugby can take over your life and um, you know, exactly. I'd, I wouldn't be surprised if she does come back, you yeah. know, she's, she... I don't think she's making a decision on club rugby yet, club she rugby might for play Munster, for Munster, yeah. yeah. Which would um, be a nice kind of balance for her, would it? Yeah. She, she, she's big into farming, I think. She is, yeah. Like she has, um, she works on the farm with her parents, and um, yeah, I'm delighted. Like she had such a great game. She, she scored two tries and got player of the match, so it was a great send off for Ideal her. Ideal way to leave, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, you know, it was a brilliant. Well, she um, the last forty one caps, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, you're right. Forty one that, caps. That's a great picture with her being hoisted yeah. up by a teammate. So that's a framer, isn't it? So she's um, she's a great leader yeah. and she's very very popular. And she'd be really sadly missed. It's it's a shame so many of these big figures now, you know, Kira Griffin, Lindsay P are all starting ret to retire Claire and you Malloy just wonder who's one. going to be next, Claire Manoy, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a lot to come from this Irish team. It'd be great to see some of the younger girls come through um, now from the under 18s. Well, that's it. It level, makes space so. for young young kids mm. to come through or young girls to come through. So um, it. it's just a uh, changing of the of the tide, isn't it? That's and it. do you have any memories of playing with Kira specifically? Or you just remember her being a great leader and a great player? Yeah, I was lucky to play with her in the 2017, 2018 and 19 Six Nations. Um, and yeah, she just leads from the front and like she put, she wears her heart on, the, um, on her sleeve and she'll do everything for you on the pitch. And, you know, I just had some of, the, some of the best games I've had. You know, my first cap was alongside her against, Fr against France. And she gave me a little pep talk before one of the matches because I would suffer really badly yeah. with my nerves. Oh, really? uh, yeah, yeah, before games and be really sick and just could not concentrate. And she would give me a little pep talk. Said, yeah. You can do this. Like this show, like you guys give me a pep talk <laughs> yeah. before I come on. Like, you can do this. Like, great confidence building. So, um, yeah, I'm gutted. Mm. If I was to ever get back into the Irish jersey, touch wood now, 
it'd be a shame not to, to yeah. pull a jersey on alongside her, you know? Yeah, well, we'd love to see you back me yeah. playing, Megan. <laughs> yeah, you still have a bit of unfinished business in the Irish jersey, yeah. don't you? Yeah, hope, yeah, definitely. It's still in the back of my head, you know? Come on, we need you back. I yeah. hope. We need you back, yeah? <laughs> okay. Thanks. Well, that's all we have time for today. But before we go, House of Rugby, in partnership with our sponsors, Bank of Ireland, are looking for your help to celebrate some of Club Rugby's unsung heroes. And we're going to ask for your help. Every club across Connacht, Leinster, Ulster and Munster are kept ticking over by the volunteers, coaches, the fans, the players that truly make it part of their community. Devin Soda! <laughs> so that's your nomination, Devin. Sorry, yeah, that's, that's my nomination, definitely. Without yeah. a doubt, unsung hero. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. But we're going to need more than one, so we want your nominations, please, and your reasons why. And who knows, we might just show up to celebrate that person. Devin, we might show up to your house. <laughs> um, so please go to sportsshow.ie forward slash rugby forward slash never stop competing, and that's where we want your nominations, please. Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been so much fun having you on the show. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for joining us. I've had that. Hey, two, three, four. Yes, two, three, four. Squeeze! Oh, point. <laughs> you are so man, Mike. It's lovely to meet you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. I've had a fun. great time. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be back next week and we're we'll covering the URC again. And hopefully, Jason Hennessy will be back. We'll see you then. Joe presents House of Rugby, United Rugby Championship, together with Bank of Ireland, proud supporter of Irish provinces.